Hey guys, how you doing? All right, well, thus begins the course proper. This will be our first real lecture per se in the course. Um, and by the way, I will be beginning in chapter one and basically we'll be covering the chapters in order. Um, I will try to flag those on the modules uh, when I build them out in um, Quercus so that you'll actually have a clear sense of you know, what chapters we're covering in given modules. Um, I will uh, also try to kind of you know, be clear about it as we're going through these lectures. So, you know, what, what I'm doing today is uh, chapter one. Uh, in this module, we will do chapter one and chapter two. Uh, we'll be covered in both of these, okay? Now, these are the um, sort of setting the stage chapters, I guess. Um, so we're not even going to really talk a whole lot about psychology in these next two. Um, in the first one, we're going to talk a little bit about um, just the process of, of history. You know, what's history about? What, what, does, what are some of the things we should think about when we're reading a history textbook? What are some of the biases that we should be aware of, um, etc. So we're going to talk about the sort of process, I guess, of collecting a history of, of anything, um, psychology included. Um, and, you know, you're going to see it's a little more complex, I think, than, than you may have thought. Um, in chapter two, we'll move on to talk about some of the very, very early um, things that happened that influenced psychology or that will continue to influence psychology as we go through the course. Um, so some really, we, you know, we could think of them as the ancients. They call them the touchstones in the chapter. But, you know, characters from the, you know, literally the Pythagoras kind of era, uh, what did what they do why does it still matter? Um, and how is it going to come through in this course over and over again? So once we have those first two chapters, then we'll be in a good position to kind of start getting to a more recent history, which is still going to be, you know, two or hundred years uh, in the past, uh, but one where we can start seeing the development of psychology as a discipline and, and talking about it. All right. So we're starting at the beginning. Dum -da -dum -dum. When, you know, uh, somebody takes on that task of documenting history, you know, it's tricky because you are in the present, right? And, and now you're going to look back in the past and you're going to tell the story of how something came to be uh, what we see today. When we tell that story, um, there's sort of two differing ways. I mean, these two things happen together, but there's two approaches you can imagine somebody using. Uh, in something like the history of psychology, they could have a person-centric approach where they're really focusing on who the critical people were, the critical figures in psychology, um, and what they were all about. You know, what, what, what does, what's Freud all about? You know, and what are his theories and what are his ideas? And you're definitely going to get a lot of that in this course. Um, but what a lot of people want to stress is, is as important sometimes as the person is the zeitgeist or the cultural context within which they lived. Um, this is a, a German word, Zeitgeist. Um, I'm not exactly sure of, of the of the translation. Maybe somebody can can help us with that. Uh, but I want to give you just a, a, an example to make that make sense. You know, you could take someone like Darwin, and and you could see Darwin as the father of evolution theory. Uh, and when you kind of talk about it that way and and connect it with Darwin, the impression you're almost given given giving is that evolution theory would never have come about if not for Darwin. You know, it was his idea, he expressed it, and it became huge, but if he didn't exist, it may never have happened. A lot of people think that places too much importance on the person and neglects the importance of the zeitgeist, the cultural context. So for example, when it comes to evolution theory, um, many of you know that there was another scientist uh, who had a very similar idea uh, and there is no impression that he stole that idea from, from um, Darwin, but rather that he also came to that same idea. Well, how could two people come to some idea that never had existed before them, but then suddenly at around the same time, they both come up with the same idea? Well, people say that's because that idea was ready to happen. Um, there were other things going on. So let me give you a context. In geology, in geography at the time, geology, sorry, when people are looking at rock formations and structures, 
they began to flirt with the idea that when you go down a mountain and you see these different striata, these different parts of the rock structure, that they tell you something about the environment in which, well, the environment that existed at the time that rock structure was at the surface. Um, and so you see certain characteristics. Let's say you see a lot of um, see, see a lot of shells, what, what are those called fossils of shells within an area, right? And then you can say, oh, okay, so at the time when that was at the top of this mountain, when this was the upper surface, there must have been water on the mountain. Um, and that was the environment that, that led to all these shells. And so what we're seeing are differences in rock structures that are tied to the environmental conditions um, of the time, right? Uh, and so when you're kind of thinking of that, the connection between something and its environment and the environment kind of shapes the attributes that you see, this is getting very close to Darwin. You know, Darwin took that idea and applied it to living beings. Um, the attributes that living beings have may reflect the environment in which they live and, and, and the opportunities within those environments. And so this geography example is just one example where people at that time were thinking of the connection between the environment and attributes of things. Uh, and this was fairly widespread. And so when this is the sort of zeitgeist, when this is kind of what's on a lot of people's minds, suddenly it's not surprising that two individuals would sort of have that same additional idea, right? Or extend the idea to this specific case of living organisms. Um, and, and so the bigger picture here is that yes, people play an important role and certain people have advanced ideas and, and, and we give them a lot of credit for doing that, but maybe we give them too much credit. You know, maybe we should be thinking about the situation. Maybe if that person didn't exist, somebody else would have come up with the same idea. And, and maybe the history of science might not be all that different other than the name that we use, right? Kind of an interesting way of thinking about it. Now, I've been talking about the subject of study, you know, Freud, the, the historical figure. And so we can look at that historical figure or we can look at the zeitgeist in which that historical figure lived. But what a lot of people also want to say is just as important as the subject of your history is the narrator of your history, okay? Um, as you'll see in the textbook, the first history of psych textbook is attributed to a guy named Boring. Um, I know, history boring. He just didn't have a shot, did he? Um, but nonetheless, he did have a shot. He did very well, actually. So I, far be it for me to, to pick on Boring. He, he probably uh, was highly successful. He wrote the most successful uh, history of psychology textbook. But the point here is, his perspective, the way he thinks about things, will affect the way he writes about them. The story is important, but the story is a reflection of the storyteller. And not just the storyteller themselves, but the context in which the storyteller exists. Okay, um, so let me give you an example of this. One of the things you'll hear about a little bit in the textbook is... Uh, feminism and, and the fact that a lot of females within the history of psychology, um, their contributions were not properly acknowledged in, in earlier textbooks. Um, and, you know, the claim would be, like, for example, in Boring's day, um, women were not expected to do science. Um, it was still, you know, women are more the center of the household. Men are the ones that go out and do the jobs, including the scientist job. Um, and so it's very natural for Boring to not focus on the women of science, to, to almost not even notice the women of science, to only be thinking in terms of, okay, who are these important men? Uh, because that was his environment. Okay, that was the zeitgeist. Now we go through the feminist movement, and when you look at history from now a modern lens, you know, a modern cultural context, um, you say that's not right. You know, we are now much more in a position where we believe that, you know, women can do anything a male can do, and that they have been doing important things for a long period of time, and we recognize that we've had a bias um, to not uh, notice them and, and not, you know, give them the credit to which they're due. Uh, and so that zeitgeist of the narrator has changed 
And as a result, modern history of psychology textbooks are, are much better at acknowledging the contribution of underrepresented groups in general. Because, it's, I mean, I've picked on, picked on women. <laughs> I've chosen the feminist kind of lens to talk about. Uh, but you could say the same thing about, you know, any underrepresented group, that, they, that their contributions also tend to be underrepresented. Um, and, and we try to do a better job of that now uh, than they perhaps did uh, in, in older textbooks. So again... The bigger story here is history is not an accumulation of facts. History is a story. Um, and, the, and the actors in that story are important, but so too is the set in which they lived. So we have to be thinking about that. But just as important as the storyteller and the set in which they live. All of these affect the story that will be told. And you should really be aware of that when you're interacting with a history narrative. Um, and, and you should be kind of considering these things a little bit in order to um, think about it, you know, in the, in the most appropriate ways. Okay? All right, let's go from there. You're going to get this, this contrast in the textbook between Jacob's Ladder and, well, let's just start with Jacob's Ladder and Onyx Wheel. We'll get to Onyx Wheel in a second. But they talk about the old old history is what they call it. And what they really mean is the sort of set of assumptions that were in play um, when somebody told a historical story. And when it was with respect to the history of science, almost all of the earlier history of science textbook portrayed these scientists as very objective, you know, almost like they're just looking for facts. They are not susceptible to emotional biases or social influences or whatever. They've come up with a highly objective way to get at the truth. Um, and so, you know, they're very neutral. They're not looking for anything specifically or not whatever. They're just um, coming up with theories and collecting data and disposing of the bad theories, promoting the, the ones that seem better and building on them and making them more complex. And so the feeling is that, that they're on this, this progress, this line upwards, where the line upwards represents the knowledge accumulation, right? And so that as the scientific process is engaged, we're just getting more and more and more knowledge, more and more and more knowledge. And, it, and the knowledge reflects sort of truth, right? We're, we're learning about the truth of the world in an ever-increasing way. Um, now, that's the way people told the story. And so they would talk about these scientists and how scientists have added to the work of others and how this has increased our overall understanding of the world, whatever it may be. A very common kind of approach for talking about things. But as you'll see, people have called into doubt a lot of these assumptions. Um, and and um, they a lot of people do not believe that science progresses in this nice linear straight line of ever increasing knowledge, um, but rather that there's more of a cyclical kind of vibe to it. Let's get there. Um, so by the way, Jacob's ladder, just so you understand that analogy, Jacob's ladder, uh, Jacob had a ladder to heaven um, uh, in, in one of the biblical references. And so, you know, imagine this ladder where you're always going up, you're always getting to a purer and purer state closer to heaven, except to a scientist, heaven is truth, but you're getting closer to that all the time as you go up. Um, you know, that would be a Jacob's ladder kind of notion. All right. So now let's talk about new history and Ixian's wheel. So really Thomas Kuhn is the, the, the troublemaker, uh, Thomas Kuhn being a, a philosopher uh, primarily, um, but he really emphasized context. So we've already talked about this a little bit with Zeitgeist, right? The context in which someone lived. He took it sort of a step further, at least a step more wow, specific by talking about paradigms. So paradigms are, are more specific than zeitgeist. The zeitgeist is just sort of, hey, everybody's into the connection between the environment and things. You know, it's just a general kind of thing that's in fashion or a way of thinking that's in fashion. A paradigm is more specific. It, it's kind of the way um, a scientist, the, the rules and such a scientist buys into as reflecting the right way to conduct science. It also includes the current theories of the day, what they kind of believe to be true. Uh, often the paradigms they use reflect the theories that they believe in. Um, and so what Kuhn said is that these paradigms, they're affecting 
what scientists see and what they don't even look at um, and how they understand their data. That scientists are not this objective you know, thing that just looks for the truth. Rather, you've got to figure out the data. And when you're figuring out the data, well, first of all, you got to figure out what data you even want. And, you know, your paradigms tell you where you think the important data may lie. And you could be wrong, right? Because it's your paradigm that's pushing you to a certain way. So the things you believe are pushing you to do science in a, in a certain way, to study it in certain situations, and to explain it in a certain way when you do that. Um, but somebody could come with a different paradigm and think about the whole thing very differently. I'm going to get you there. Um, we're going to we're going to work through this and do some examples, okay? So if we just continue on with this, just to think about it, it affects the kinds of questions that scientists ask and the experiments they ran and therefore the data they got. Um, so to understand the history of science, you must understand the dominant paradigms and appreciate their impact. So he's saying it's not just enough to think about zeitgeist. It's not just enough to think about the people. But when you're thinking about the people, the scientists, you really want to understand how they thought about things because that's a big part of the story of why they did the things they did. Okay, Their, their belief structure affects their behavior. Okay, So let's we'll work through this a little bit as we go through. Let me just, just try to make the example. This doesn't always work. I hope it works. If I asked you what these little critters were, so you've seen these, you see these guys, and I show you this, I'll show you one on its own. You say, what is that thing? What, what? Give it a name. What would you call it? Uh, it turns out most people call it either some sort of um, rabbit, or they call it some sort of bird, or sometimes antelope, <laughs> just to make life difficult for you. Um, what if instead I showed that to you like this? What's it now? Well, now it's a bird, right? When you see these things with the slightly rounder heads here, so that's the real difference. These guys got rounded heads. Now you kind of see the roundness of this head, and you can see how it kind of looks like those things, which would be like a bird. Um, or maybe, you know, maybe you think a rabbit. If you think those are rabbit ears, then the round thing might be the rabbit's snout. So maybe you see it as, as a rabbit. But the idea is you're seeing more sort of rounding here. Whereas this one, which theoretically is an antelope, you see is an antelope, uh, has a more sloping, you know, straight right back to his right back to his antlers. Okay, whether you see those two, you probably see these two here. They look different to you when you look at these, these two. The point is, if you live in a world of these, if this is your paradigm, <laughs> right, where you think a lot about these sorts of things, and then you see this, this is your data. It seems to fit, you know. It seems to fit with that paradigm uh, pretty well. Uh, it seems to go along with what you already believe. Um, but if you believe this, and you've seen this a lot, well, it kind of goes along with that too. Okay, it fits with that. So again, the point here being that a given bit of data may support your view. But there may be different views that all can sort of accommodate that data. So we feel very good when, oh, we found another one that fits with our way of, of believing things. But it could fit with a bunch of other things too. Um, and, and so, you know, if we really want to be dispassionate and objective, we just look at the data for what it is. But the claim is we can't do that very well. Uh, we're human beings. And so we went looking for this data because we had a theory. And when we see the data, we see it in terms of the theory. And people with different theories can see the same data in different ways. Okay, so the importance of the theory and the paradigm in determining how somebody reacts to a given bit of data. I'm going to give you more examples. So that's one. If this is still a little like, eh, it's okay. Hang with me. Hang with me. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, this is just a little quote. Um, the act of thinking is often called reflection. I'm very apt. Um, after all, man can only ever see himself, that is, his own values in things. When you recognize something, you're connecting what you're seeing to something that's in your mind, something you understand, something that you know. That's what allows you to say, oh, I get what that thing is because it connects with something I know. And so therefore, what you know, what's in your mind when you're looking at something determines how you'll see it. One more attempt. <laughs> uh, 
Um, well, okay, let me just very quickly say, this, this is something you guys all know, and, you, and you've probably had this sort of rattling around in your skull as I've been talking about it. I'll, I'll throw the little cartoon up there too. Um, but you've heard of something called confirmation bias. Uh, and, and what confirmation bias says is, you know, you start with beliefs. You have a set of beliefs. You can't just walk away from your beliefs. So when you now encounter some set of data, um, well, we know that we really like data, so-called facts, that fit with what we already believe. And when we find data that fits with what we believe, we grab onto it and we embrace it and we go, yeah, I knew it. I knew it. I like that data. Um, what about these facts that don't fit with what we believe? Well, there's a lot of psychological research that says, first of all, we have a hard time even acknowledging the existence of those facts. We don't go looking for them. We don't go looking for facts that disconfirm what we believe because they're annoying, right? They make us have to rethink of everything. And if one of those is put in our face, you know, suddenly somebody puts a fact in front of us that doesn't fit with our beliefs, we are very hesitant to accept it and analyze it. We would rather downplay it. We would rather ignore it. We'd rather put it aside. We are very hesitant to accept data that completely goes against what we believe to be true. Okay, um, so when you believe that scientists are objective, what we're saying is that they are just accepting the data in a non-judgmental way. But we know humans are not like that. Humans go looking for data that confirm what they believe. And scientists are humans. Um, and, and so we should believe this is true of them too. And there's a lot of evidence that suggests it is. Okay, so that's just confirmation bias. So the idea, and I'll make this concrete from Kuhn, is that science is continually evolving because paradigms are changing. Evolving is the wrong word. I shouldn't have said that. Um, science is changing uh, over time. And um, let me sort of walk you through the, let's, let's go through this cycle first of all, and then we'll, we'll get it. So the claim is there's periods of time which he calls normal science. Um, I'm not sure why the pre-science label is there, but normal science, where the whole scientific community kind of agrees on a set of beliefs, um, and those beliefs include usually methodological beliefs, beliefs about the right way to do science. Um, and and so they all buy into it together, um, and and they do and they're doing science the same way, largely. Um, and so that's sort of a happy happy group but then some scientists come along and they start doing things a little differently or they start embracing something that that doesn't fit very well with the normal approach which causes a sort of crisis like are these people doing it wrong are they doing it differently what does how do we think of their data in light of what most of us are doing in our normal science way and if we actually if they actually make some gains if they've kind of discover something or push our knowledge in a, by using a sort of different approach or a different set of beliefs then this can cause so-called model revolution. So we start to think, oh, maybe that wasn't the right way to be doing things all along, which can cause paradigm change, where we suddenly say, okay, yeah, we should be doing something different. Um, and then we go into a new common shared belief structure, okay? So let me give you some, um, you know, just sort of a, one example of that from psychology so that you'll have a sense. And then I'm going to give you some examples from science more generally. But imagine um, the shift from behaviorism to cognitive psychology that kind of happened in the 1960s. We'll talk about it more, but, you know, in the behaviorism approach, first of all, I, I'm saying things to you like there's a common belief structure. Well, one of the belief structures of behaviorists was you only talk about things you can directly measure or directly manipulate. So you can manipulate stimuli, you can measure behavioral responses. And so we sometimes call it SR psychology because they were focused on, if I put an animal in the, this stimulus situation and I measure how they respond, then I can change the stimulus situation in measurable ways and I can see its effect on, on responses, on behavior in measurable ways. And that's the way to do science. Uh, in fact, it got so specific that most of the science was done on animals. And, you know, we sometimes call this rat psychology time, right? Rats and mazes and all that kind of stuff. 
that was considered the way to do psychology. And you certainly didn't talk about memory or attention or consciousness because those were fluffy concepts you couldn't study. Yeah, okay, so that reigned for a long time uh, in the 1950s and into the 1960s. And, and it goes back, by the way, more like in the 30s and 40s. Um, but at some point, somewhere around the 60s, computers started to be invented. And computers provided an analogy of a thinking machine. But one where you could see the inside, you can see things like memory. You can think of things like attention in terms of scanning the input devices for input. Um, suddenly a lot of the things that were considered non-scientific to a behaviorist, people were saying, well, I don't know, that's not that you can, you can imagine in concrete ways how memory works and what it does. And, and so suddenly they became less vague. And over this time, people started embracing a more open view of psychology, one that could study things like memory and attention. Um, and new methods started to be developed that could get at this kind of approach. And those new methods started bearing fruit. We started seeing that cognitive psychologists were finding some cool data and making some cool claims. And then this is where we're kind of in the model revolution paradigm change in the sense that people started to say, you know what, maybe behaviorism was a limited space and you could only do so much or learn so much and it's time to move on. Uh, and so literally that is what happened. Very, pretty much every psychologist, not every psychologist, but, but the, the modal group of psychologists shifted from a behaviorist kind of approach to a much more cognitive kind of approach. And by the you know, 1970s, the new normal science, 1970s and 80s, was much more cognitive psychology kind of based. Now, we could say, oh yeah, but now it's more about neuroscience. Yeah, well, cognitive psychology became limiting at some point, and we got these new tools that we could look at the brain in action. Um, and these new tools started bearing fruit, some interesting results. And suddenly we started to think maybe cognitive psychology is not the right way, the way we were doing it. Maybe we need to include more brain measurement and, and suddenly cognitive neuroscience uh, is born uh, and neuroscience in general. Okay, so you get the Kuhnian cycle there that science is constantly reshaping how it works. You know, what it even thinks of as the right scientific approach. All right, so. That was psychology. I talked to you a few things. Here's just a couple of other things just to try to hit this idea over the head because it's an important idea, these paradigm shifts. And it's a cool idea, I think. Um, the, the first one is my favorite, uh, the Copernican Revolution. You know, the very idea that people were looking up at stars for, you know, forever um, and thinking of them as though the Earth was in the middle of the world and the stars were rotating around the Earth. Um, and so when, you know, people interested in astronomy were tracking the stars, that's what they assumed they were seeing is some star moving around them with them being a stationary body. Then Copernicus comes along and says, ah, you know what, the Earth's not in the middle, the sun's in the middle, Earth's going around the sun. Um, and, and now suddenly, when you look at the stars, it's the same stars, it's the same motions, same data, but it's different. Right? The way you understand it, what you're seeing, is completely different because your theoretical perspective has shifted. Your paradigm has shifted from an Earth-centric one to a heliocentric one. And when your paradigm shifts, that changes the way you think about the data. Uh, I actually think that's you know one of the best examples. A couple of other ones for you, you sort of science nerds out there, the flood justin theory. Um, so you know, of chemical reactions, so this changed the way that people thought of chemical reactions. Um, origin of the species, by the way, changed the way people thought about biology. Um, they used to be just classifying animals, saying these guys have similar attributes as these guys. Um, but thanks to Charles, people started saying, why do they have that attribute? And so the study of biology became one of trying to understand um, the evolutionary advantages that certain attributes gave you, etc. So it literally changed the way people do biology. It also changed psychology, by the way, and lots, a lot of the sciences it changed. Um, once we understood how genes are inherited, Mendelian inheritance rules, um, then we started thinking differently about um, you know, nature and how it works within us and all that kind of thing. Newton's idea of gravity and Einstein's view to re relativity. So we go from a Newtonian physics to an Einsteinian physics and everything changes. Um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, 
understanding the DNA. These are all things where you know these new ideas didn't just increase our understanding a little bit. They changed the whole way we do the science. They changed our paradigm. They shifted our paradigm. And that shifted the way we thought of all the old data as well. Okay. All right. So this kind of brings us now to this Ixion's wheel. So what is this Ixion's wheel about? It's another biblical kind of story. Ixion um, upset somebody. Probably God. I don't know. <laughs> and he gets attached to a wheel in hell. So he ends up forever sort of being rotisserie fried in hell, I guess. I don't know why you need the wheel. The flames aren't enough. to You have to be spinning on a wheel at the same time. Um, but the wheel-like structure is the important thing because it implies that maybe our knowledge is not progressing on this beautiful, straight, objective line towards the truth. But rather, maybe we're kind of coming back to the same data or the same questions or the same ideas, maybe with a new paradigm in hand. You know, maybe the paradigm has shifted. And so we're now coming back to these ideas and thinking about them differently. But the claim is that most of our new ideas really aren't that new. That, they're, that they've already sort of existed before in maybe a slightly different form, dis discussed in a slightly different way, but they're really kind of this cyclical thing that keeps coming back, and we keep thinking about it in a different way. Um, and therefore, science may be progressing far more slowly. It may seem to be progressing because we feel like we understand it differently, um, but that may just be because the paradigm has shifted and we still might not be in the right paradigm. So we might, you know, think back now to the earth centric people, right? At the time, they thought they had a great understanding, but they had the wrong paradigm. Once the paradigm changes, their understanding is no longer valid and you have to get a new understanding. So maybe kind of like hell, that's what we're doing. We keep coming back and we're understanding the same data in different ways. But that doesn't mean the new way is any better than the old way. Um, so, th you know, this is as far as a progress to the truth, this is a little more depressing. Um, but the idea here, the bigger idea, as we think of the history of science, is just to be aware of this. You know, not to take this naive view that, um, that psychologists are, the, well, any scientists are these purely objective things only interested in the truth with these pure theoretical things that have no bias within them and therefore march us off to the truth. So the central point is that's probably very naive. Um, and although some of the older history textbooks kind of described it like that, um, it's, it's probably not a good way to describe it. We should be paying attention to the paradigms and the roles they were playing and, and understanding that often what looks like an advance in science may be just a reinterpretation or a different way of thinking about the same thing. So once again, it's more like a cautionary tale for us as we interact with history to be aware of the importance of all of these things. I'm gonna continue the cautionary tale um, in the next lecture, but I believe that is it for this one, it is. Um, so. Thank you. That was lecture one. That one was a little longer than most of them will be. Uh, I knew it would be. Uh, I'm going to try to keep the other ones a little shorter, but, but I knew to kind of set the stage we needed that first long one. So hopefully you stuck with it. Maybe you made me talk twice, twice as fast as I sometimes do. I can't actually do that. Um, but uh, yeah, let's just keep going. So after you're done this one, very soon thereafter, the other one should appear. So keep at it. Uh, I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye, guys.